Welcome back to the Buddhist Bookshelf YouTube channel. In today's session, we'll be continuing our exploration of the Sarlas Flower, a profound literary creation authored by Ngoc Tran, who is also recognized by the Dharma name Tian Fuk. This episode signifies the 40th installment in this enlightening series. 535. Two Aspects of a Buddhist Life. According to the Avadamsaka Sutra, there are two aspects of the Buddhist life. First, raising the desire for supreme enlightenment. The Sanskrit phrase for the desire for enlightenment is bodhisattvapada, which is the abbreviation of anitarium samyaksambodhisiddhamutpadam that is, to have a mind raised to supreme enlightenment. In the Avadamsaka Sutra, the Buddha taught. There are only a few people in this world who can clearly perceive what the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha are and faithfully follow them. Fewer are those who can raise their minds to supreme enlightenment, fewer still are those who practice Prajaparamita, fewer and fewer still are those who most steadfastly practicing Prajnaparamita and finally reaching the stage of no turning back, abide in the state of Bodhisattvahood. Second, practicing the life of the Bodhisattva. Here, we want to talk about the Bodhisattva Samantabhadra. Siddhana, the young pilgrim had his first awakening of the desire, Siddhapada, under the direction of Manjusri, and his later pilgrimage consisted wholly in inquiries into living the life of enlightenment, Bodhikarya. So says Manjusri to his disciple when he sends Siddhana off on his long, arduous pilgrim's progress. Well done, well done, indeed, son of a good family. Having awakened the desire for supreme enlightenment, you now wish to seek for the life of the Bodhisattva. Oh! Son of a good family, it is a rare thing to see beings whose desire is raised to supreme enlightenment, but it is a still rarer thing to see beings who, having awakened the desire for supreme enlightenment, proceed to seek for the life of the Bodhisattva. Therefore, oh! Son of a good family, if you wish to attain the knowledge which is possessed by the All-Knowing One, be ever assiduous to get associated with good friends, Kalyanamitra. In the Prajnaparamita Sutra, after the awakening of the desire for supreme enlightenment, is the practice of Prajnaparamitas. In the Avadamsaka Sutra, this practice is deeply associated with the life of the Bodhisattva known as Samantabhadra, and the Bodhikarya, the life of enlightenment, is identified with the Badrakarya, the life of Badra, that is Samantabhadra. 536. Attainment of virtues. Buddhists must definitely build up their foundation. It is strict observance of the precepts in order to possess a virtue. According to Buddhism, what is the attainment of no virtues? Attainment of no virtues means having no firm foundation of cultivation. Some left home people not only break the Buddhist precepts, but they also use the money donated by lay people not for Buddhist affairs, but for their own family or business. They not only want no cultivation, but they also go against the Buddha's basic teachings. What a misfortune for Buddhism! Some people say, well, cultivate or not cultivate, eventually everybody will die. Thus, can people who cultivate avoid death? Well, everyone will eventually die in accordance with the law of impermanence. However, for true Buddhist cultivators, when the time comes, you die in understanding what is going on you are totally clear and lucid. Certainly, true Buddhist cultivators will not be afflicted with deep distress and anxiety, but when the time comes they surely die in a peaceful manner. And certainly, when the time comes they know how they came, and they understand how they will go. They are very lucid and unconfused. In the contrary, if you are not a true Buddhist cultivator, you do not cultivate or you just pretend to cultivate, when the time comes you will die in confusion and ignorance, worrying about this and thinking about that. Their mind will not be clear and pure, and they will die with anguish and regret. These people are confused for their whole lives, so that they will extremely muddle when they go. They do not know why they have come, or why they have to go. They are completely confused about where they have come from, and where they will go. According to the Sekha Sutta in the middle-length discourses of the Buddha, the Buddha confirmed rules for a noble disciple to possess a virtue. Fisut, guard the doors of his sense faculties. According to the Samanaphala Sutta in the long discourses of the Buddha, the Buddha taught about a guardian of the sense door. 
How does a monk become a guardian of the sense door? Here a monk, on seeing a visible object with the eye, does not grasp at its major signs or secondary characteristics. Because greed and sorrow, evil unskilled states, would overwhelm him if he dwelt leaving this eye faculty unguarded, so he practices guiding it, he protects the eye faculty, develops restraint of the eye faculty. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on feeling an object with the body, on thinking a thought with the mind, he does not grasp at its major signs or secondary characteristics, he develops restraint of the mind faculty. He experiences within himself the blameless bliss that comes from maintaining this area in guarding of the faculties. Second, be moderate in eating. According to the Sekka Sutta in the Middle Length Discourses of the Buddha, the Buddha confirmed his noble disciples on moderating in eating. He must reflect wisely. When he takes food, not taking for amusement, not taking for intoxication, not taking for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness, but only for the endurance and continuance of this body, for enduring discomfort, and for assisting the holy life. He should consider. Thus I shall terminate old feelings without arousing new feelings, and I shall be healthy and blameless and shall live in comfort. Third, be devoted to wakefulness. According to the Sekka Sutta in the Middle Length Discourses of the Buddha, the Buddha confirmed his noble disciples on devotion to wakefulness. During the day, while walking back and forth and sitting, a noble disciple purifies his mind of obstructive states. In the first watch of the night, while back and forth and sitting, he purifies his mind of obstructive states. In the middle watch of the night he lies down on the right side in the lion's pose with one foot overlapping the other, mindful and fully aware, after noting in his mind the time for rising. After rising, in the third watch of the night, while walking back and forth and sitting, he purifies his mind of obstructive states. Fourth, possess seven good qualities. Seven grounds for commendations a monk must always think of. According to the Sanjiti Sutta, a monk should always have seven grounds for commendations. Here a monk who is keenly anxious to undertake the training and wants to persist in this. Here a monk who is keenly anxious to make a close study of the Dhamma and wants to persist in this. Here a monk who is keenly anxious to get rid of desires and wants to persist in this. Here a monk who tries to find solitude and wants to persist in this. Here a monk who arouses energy and wants to persist in this. Here a monk who develops mindfulness and discrimination and wants to persist in this. Here a monk who develops penetrative insight and wants to persist in this. Fifth, pleasant abiding in the meditation. Sixth, all is well restrained with the Buddhist precepts. Seventh, be perfect in conduct and resort. 8. See fear in the slightest faults. 9. Train by undertaking the training precepts. 537. Great Renunciation. One of the most prominent features of the Buddha's life story is the fact that in his final existence, he was human. This information can be misleading, however, because he was much more than an ordinary person. Being a Buddha is being neither human nor God, but going beyond the nature of both. In spite of this distinction, the Buddha's tradition recalls the exemplary life of the Buddha in his human phase as a means of introducing the basic problem of human existence, the problem to which enlightenment is the solution. After his final birth the Bodhisattva was named Siddhartha, meaning one whose goal is accomplishment. The seers immediately recognized that he was a special child. Even in infancy he bore the 32 marks of a great man attesting to his uniqueness, see 32 auspicious marks. His mother, her mission accomplished, died seven days after his birth and was reborn amid the contented gods of the Tusita heaven. Siddhartha's future was prophesied twice on both occasions it was revealed that he would be either a universal king, known throughout the lands for his power and justice, or a Buddha, leading a religious life and setting humankind free from ignorance. If Siddhartha followed the life of a householder he would become a great king, but if he renounced the world he would become a Buddha. King Suddhodana was told that in order to ensure his son's royal future, he must prevent him from ever seeing the miseries of life.
the king thus built three palaces for his son and surrounded them with guards whose duty was to prevent the prince from seeing the true character of human experience. Siddhartha Gautama was a unique and talented youth. His radiance knew no bounds, and he excelled his contemporaries in skill and learning. Cushioned by all the imaginable delights of worldly life, he remained ignorant of the inevitable pain of the human condition. The Bidacharita describes his splendid surroundings in great detail, evoking, for example, the soft voices and charming music of many dancing girls, and the radiant pavilion suited to every season. In time the prince married the fair Yasadhara, and at the age of 29, it seemed as if he would proceed along the road to kingship, without ever suspecting the outside the delights of his secure haven, there was much harsher reality. One day, however, he wished to see beyond the perimeter of his guarded dwellings. The king tried to dissuade him, but on failing in this attempt, he ordered the city to be cleared of anything that might discomfort the prince. In four outings, known in the Buddhist tradition as the four sites Siddhartha encountered old age, disease, death, and finally, an ascetic who was seeking a way to transcend such suffering. He was deeply affected by this fourth encounter and vowed to abandon his princely life and seek the truth about the human condition. Having taken this resolve, Siddhartha returned to the palace, where he was notified that his wife had given birth to a son. He could not find happiness in this, and retorted, a fetter, Rahula, has been born. The king consequently decreed that his grandson should be named Rahula. At the palace all attempts to entertain Siddhartha failed. He was no longer interested in the delights of the senses, and merely fell asleep on the couch. When he awoke in the middle of the night he saw the beautiful singers and dancers sprawled inelegantly over his parlor, they seemed to him like corpses and caused him mental anguish. He resolved to carry through his great renunciation that very night, and instructed his charioteer Chandaka to prepare his great horse Kanthaka. Before leaving the palace, he visited his wife's chambers. Standing at the threshold and smelling the jasmine, his heart was filled with longing. He saw the fair Yasadhara sleeping with her hand resting on Rahula, and felt the urge to pick his son up for the last time, but he did not dare to do so for fear that he might wake them and jeopardize his departure. Under normal circumstances leaving the palace would have been impossible. There was hundreds of armed men at each of the town's massive gates. But one heavenly diva gently swung open the gate, while others muffled the sound of Kanthaka's hoofs and plunged the town's inhabitants into a deep slumber. Swiftly riding through the air, accompanied by celestial hosts of all kinds, Siddhartha, Chandaka, and Kanthaka arrived at the river Anoma. There the Bodhisattva did Chandaka to return to the palace to inform his family of his departure. Kanthaka could not bear to part with his master and died on the spot. He was reborn in the Tavatimsa heaven, the heaven of the 33 gods. Shedding his royal attire, the Bodhisattva cut off his flowing hair with one stroke of his sword and tossed into the air, saying, If I am to become a Buddha, let it remain in the sky, if not, let it fall to the ground. With his divine eye, Indra, king of the gods, saw this gesture and caught the Bodhisattva's hair in jewel casket. The god Brahma offered the Bodhisattva three saffron robes, an alms bowl, and the other requisites of a monk. A razor, a needle, a water strainer and a belt. Siddhartha was now set on the irrevocable path to liberation, at the end of which he would attain perfect wisdom and completely extinguish the flame of suffering. 538. Mendicancy. Religious mendicancy or to beg for food literally holding the bowl. There are many forms of mendicancy, but monks in monasteries of Sangabhiksu sect usually do it in group of 10 or 15. As they walk very slowly, barefooted and step by step, through the streets of a town, face down, without speaking. Mendicancy is the right livelihood of a monk. To work for a living is an improper life. In addition, Mendicancy keeps a monk humble and frees him from cares of life. In Buddhism, offering food to monks and nuns is one of the most important parts of Buddhist practice. In Asia, it is not unusual to see monks walking towards the villages early in the morning, carrying their alms bowls.
They go from house to house until someone offers them food, until their bowls filled with food and return to the monastery to eat before noon. Since monks and nuns do not choose their food, they learn to be grateful for whatever they are given. This practice helps them not to be greedy. It also gives the laity an opportunity to practice giving. Going out to collect food is less common in some countries, so the laity goes to the monastery to make offerings of food. In order to keep the fine manner of carrying the alms bowl, a bhiksu or bhiksuni should care for his or her alms bowl with respect, a bhiksu or bhiksuni should not use more than one alms bowl, a bhiksu or bhiksuni should not make noise with his or her spoon or chopsticks against his or her alms bowl. The daily alms round of monks in Theravada countries, which constitutes one of the major opportunities for merit-making on the part of the laity. In the morning, monks walk in a line, carrying their begging bowls in their hands, and lay people place food in the bowls. Sincere Buddhists should always remember that in cultivation, we must realize the state of taking the bliss of Zen as our food, that means we should let our sustenance come from Zen meditation. A person who is genuinely doing the work of meditation is no longer aware of heaven above, earth below, or people in between. He has merged completely with empty space. He no longer has any sense of self, others, living beings, or a lifespan. In the Dharmapada Sutra, the Buddha taught. A man who only asks others for alms is not a mendicant. Not even if he has professed the whole law, Dharmapada 266. A man who has transcended both good and evil, who follows the whole code of morality, who lives with understanding in this world, is indeed called a bhikshu, Dharmapada 267. According to the Vimalakirti Sutra, Vimalakirti told Mahakasyapa about the supreme meaning of mendicancy, when he saw Mahakasyapa went begging for food in a village inhabited by poor people. Mahakasyapa, you are failing to make your kind and compassionate mind all-embracing by begging from the poor while staying away from the rich. Mahakasyapa, in your practice of impartiality you should call on your donors in succession, regardless of whether they are poor or rich. You should beg for food without the ulterior idea of eating it. To wipe out the concept of rolling food into a ball in the hand, you should take it by the hand, i.e. without the idea of how you take it. You should receive the food given without the idea of receiving anything. When entering a village you should regard it as void like empty space. When seeing a form you should remain indifferent to it. When you hear a voice you should consider it as meaningless as an echo. When you smell an odor take it for the wind, which has no smell. When you eat, refrain from discerning the taste. Regard all touch as if you were realizing wisdom, which is free from feelings and emotions. You should know that all things are illusory, having neither nature of their own nor that of something else, and that since fundamentally they are not self-existent they cannot now be the subject of annihilation. Mahakasyapa if you can achieve all eight forms of liberation without keeping from the eight heterodox ways of life, that is by identifying heterodoxy with orthodoxy, both as emanating from the same source, and if you can make an offering of your own food to all living beings as well as to all Buddhas and all members of the Sangha, then you can take the food. Such a way of eating is beyond the troubles of the worldly man and the absence of the troubles of Hinayana men above the state of stillness in which Hinayana men abstain from eating, and the absence of stillness of Mahayana men who eat while in the state of serenity, and beyond both dwelling in the worldly state or in nirvana, while your donors reap neither great nor little merits. What they give being neither beneficial nor harmful. This is correct entry upon the Buddha path without relying on the small way of sravakas. Mahakasyapa, if you can so eat the food given you, your eating shall not be in vain. Vimalakirti told Subyuti about the supreme meanings of mendicancy when Subyuti went to Vimalakirti's house begging for food. Vimalakirti took Subyuti's bowl and filled it with rice, saying. Subyuti, if your mind set on eating is in the same state as when confronting all other things, and if this uniformity as regards all things equally applies to the act of eating, you can then beg for food and eat it. Subyuti, if without cutting off carnality, anger and stupidity you can keep from these three evils. 
If you do not wait for the death of your body to achieve the oneness of all things, if you do not wipe out stupidity and love in your quest of enlightenment and liberation, if you can look into the underlying nature of the five deadly sins to win liberation, with at the same time no idea of either bondage or freedom. If you give rise to neither the four noble truths nor their opposites, if you do not hold both the concept of winning and not winning the holy fruit, if you do not regard yourself as a worldly or unworldly man, as a saint or not as a saint, if you perfect all dharmas while keeping away from the concept of dharmas, then can you receive and eat the food. Subhuti, if you neither see the Buddha nor hear the dharma, if the six heterodox teachers, Purana Kasyapa, Maskari Gasalaputra, Yanjaya Varadaputra, Ajita Kasakambala, Kakuta Katyayana and Nirgrantha Jnataputra, are regarded impartially as your own teachers, and if, when they induce leavers of home into heterodoxy, you also fall with the latter, then you can take away the food and eat it. If you are unprejudiced about falling into heresy and regard yourself as not reaching the other shore of enlightenment, if you are unprejudiced about the eight sad conditions and regard yourself as not free from them, if you are unprejudiced about defilements and relinquish the concept of pure living, if when you realize samadhi in which there is absence of debate or disputation, all living beings also achieve it, if your donors of food are not regarded with partiality as cultivating the field of blessedness, if those making offerings to you are partially looked on as also falling into the three evil realms of existence, if you impartially regard demons as your companions without differentiating between them as well as between other forms of defilement. If you are discontented with all living beings, defame the Buddha, break the law, dharma, do not attain the holy rank, and fail to win liberation, then you can take away the food and eat it. According to the Pindapadaparasadasadam in the middle Agama, alms begging is one of the most important practices of Buddhist monks and nuns. In Asia, it is not unusual to see monks walking towards the villages early in the morning, carrying their alms bowls. They go from house to house until someone offers them food, until their bowls build with food and return to the monastery to eat before noon. Since monks and nuns do not choose their food, they learn to be grateful for whatever they are given. This practice helps them not to be greedy. It also gives the laity an opportunity to practice giving. Going out to collect food is less common in some countries, so the laity goes to the monastery to make offerings of food. Mendicancy is the right livelihood of a monk. To work for a living is an improper life. In addition, mendicancy keeps a monk humble and frees him from cares of life. Buddhist cultivators should always not only minimize the meeting between eye faculty and visual forms, but also minimize the meeting between ear faculty and sound, nose faculty and smell, tongue faculty and taste, and body faculty and touch, so that no or very limited consciousnesses will ever arise, eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body. The Buddha reminded his disciples that meditation is the only means to limit or stop the arising of the consciousnesses. Sincere Buddhists should always remember that in cultivation we must realize the state of taking the bliss of Zen as our food that means we should let our sustenance come from Zen meditation. A person who is genuinely doing the work of meditation is no longer aware of heaven above, earth below, or people in between. He has merged completely with empty space. He no longer has any sense of self, others, living beings, or a lifespan. Besides, he must minimize the five desires, overcome the five hindrances, thoroughly understand the five skandhas, the five tenacious bonds or skandhas, attaching to mortality, cultivate the four kinds of mindfulness, cultivate the four right efforts, cultivate the four sufficiences, cultivate the pansendriyani, five faculties, cultivate the panka balani, five powers, cultivate the sapta bhadyangani, the seven bhadyanga, cultivate the eightfold noble truth, cultivate samatha and vipassana, and enlightenment and emancipation. When Prince Siddhartha became an ascetics, a poor seeker of the truth, he began to look for a teacher who could show him the way to end all sufferings and afflictions. He wandered through the forests and spoke to all holy men he found there. Everywhere he went he was welcomed with respect. 
even though he now wore ragged clothes and ate only the simple food he could beg, but he was respected wherever he came. One day, he was walking through Rahagriha, the capital of Magadha, he passed near the palace gate. One of the King Bimbisara's ministers saw him and immediately ran to report to the king. Your Majesty, I have just seen a most unzual man in the city. He dressed in rags and begs his food from door to door, but I am sure he must be a great person. His face is so strong and he walks with such dignity. The king was very interested and asked that Siddhartha be brought before him. They talked together for a while, and the king was very impressed by his intelligence, modesty and kind manner. Then the king suggested that the prince settle in Rahagriha to help the king to rule the kingdom. But Siddhartha replied politely. Your Majesty, thank you for your offer, I have already had the chance to rule a kingdom, but I refused because I just wanted to renounce the world to find the truth that I can help save people to end sufferings and afflictions. The king bowed to Siddhartha to ask him to come back to teach him when Siddhartha did find the truth. Even if Siddhartha failed, he was always welcome to return to Magadha. 539. Basis of Bodhisattvas. According to the Flower Adornment Sutra, Chapter 38, there are ten kinds of basis on which great enlightening beings carry out their practices. First, they carry out the practices of enlightening beings, based on honoring all Buddhas. Second, they carry out the practices of taming all sentient beings. Third, associating with all good companions. Fourth, accumulating all roots of goodness. Fifth, purifying all Buddha lands. Sixth, not to abandon all sentient beings. Seventh, entering deeply into all transcendent ways. Eighth, fulfilling vows of enlightening beings. Ninth, infinite will for enlightenment. Tenth, enlightenment of all Buddhas. 540. 20 Parents and Relatives of Bodhisattvas. According to Zen Master D.T. Suzuki in Essays in Zen Buddhism, Book 3 Bodhisattvas have 20 parents and relatives. First, Prajna, wisdom, is his mother. Second, Upaya, skillful means, is his father. Third, Dana, charity, is his wet nurse. Fourth, Sila, morality, is his supporter. Fifth, Santi, patience, is his decoration. Sixth, Virya, strenuousness or energy, is his nurse. Seventh, Dhyana, meditation, is his cleaner. Eighth, good friends are his instructors. Ninth, all factors of enlightenment are his companions. Tenth, all bodhisattvas are his brothers. Eleventh, the bodhisattva is his home. Twelfth, to conduct himself in accordance with the truth is his family manners. Thirteenth, the bhumis are his residence. Fourteenth, the kshantis are his family members. Fifteenth, the vows are his family motto. Sixteenth, to promote deeds of devotion is his family legacy. Seventeenth, to make others accept Mahayana is his family business. Eighteenth, to be anointed after being bound for one more birth is his destiny as crown prince in the kingdom of Dharma. Nineteenth, Paramitas are the prajna boat which conveys him to another shore of enlightenment. Twentieth, to arrive at the full knowledge of Tathagatahood forms the foundation of his pure family relationship. 541. Bodhisattva's Ten Appellations. According to the Flower Adornment Sutra, Chapter 38, after accomplishing cultivating ten ways of generating the qualities of Buddhahood, enlightening beings will attain these ten appellations of greatness, see ten ways of generating the qualities of Buddhahood. First, they are called beings of enlightenment because they are born of knowledge of enlightenment. Second, they are called great beings because they dwell in the great vehicle. Third, they are called foremost beings because they realize the foremost truth. Fourth, they are called superior beings because they are aware of high laws. Fifth, they are called supreme beings because their knowledge is supreme. Sixth, they are called exalted beings because they reveal the unexcelled teaching. Seventh, they are called beings of power because they have extensive knowledge of the ten powers. Eighth, they are called incomparable beings because they have no peer in the world. Ninth, they are called inconceivable beings because they become Buddhas in an instant. Tenth, enlightening beings win these appellations accomplish the paths of enlightening beings. 
542. The Quest for Truth. According to the Flower Adornment Sutra, Chapter 38, there are ten kinds of quest for truth of great enlightening beings. Enlightening beings who abide by these can attain great knowledge of all elements of Buddhahood without being instructed by another. First, quest for truth with a straightforward mind, being free from dishonesty. Second, diligent quest for truth, being free from laziness. Third, wholly devoted quest for truth, not begrudging their lives. Fourth, quest for truth to destroy all sentient beings' afflictions, not doing it for fame, profit, or respect. Fifth, quest for truth to benefit self and others, all sentient beings, not just helping themselves. Sixth, quest for truth to enter knowledge of wisdom, not taking pleasure in literature. Seventh, quest for truth to leave birth and death, not craving worldly pleasures. Eighth, quest for truth to liberate sentient beings, engendering the determination for enlightenment. Ninth, quest for truth to resolve the doubts of all sentient beings, to free them from vacillation. Tenth, quest for truth to fulfill Buddhahood, not being inclined to lesser aims. 543. Behaviors of the Saints. The term noble or wise is equivalent with the Sanskrit term of Arya, which means a person who has attained the path of seeing, Darsana Marga, the third of the five Buddhist paths. In Mahayana, this means that such a person has had directed experience of emptiness, sunyata. In Buddhism, a sage is the one who is wise and good, and is correct in all his characters. According to the Sanjiti Sutta in the Long Discourses of the Buddha, there are the four holy ways. First, being content with wearing rags from dust heaps. Here a monk is content with any old robe, praises such contentment, and does not try to obtain robes improperly or unsuitably. He does not worry if he does not get a robe, and if he does, he is not full of greedy, blind desire, but makes use of it aware of such dangers and wisely aware of its true purpose. Nor is he conceited about being thus content with any old robe, and he does not disparage others. And one who is thus skillful, not lax, clearly aware and mindful, is known as a monk who is true to the ancient original Aryan lineage. Second, being content with any alms food he may get, similar as in the first paragraph, Third, being content with any old lodging place or sitting under trees, similar as in the first paragraph. Fourth, entire withdrawal from the world or fond of abandoning, similar as in the first paragraph. According to the Sanjiti Sutta in the Long Discourses of the Buddha, there are four Aryan modes of speech. Retraining from lying, refraining from slandering, refraining from abusing or using rude words, and refraining from idle gossip. There are also four more Aryan modes of speech. Stating that one has not seen, known what one has not seen, stating that one has not heard, known what one has not heard, stating that one has not sensed, known what one has not sensed, and stating that one has not known, known what one has not known. There are also four more Aryan modes of speech. Stating that one has seen, known what one has seen, stating that one has heard, known what one has heard, stating that one has sensed, known what one has sensed, and stating that one has known, known what one has known. 544. The Unwritten Sacred Literature. A Sanskrit term for noble or wise. A person who has attained a path of seeing, Darsana Marga, the third of the five Buddhist paths. In Mahayana, this means that such a person has had directed experience of emptiness, sunyata. In Buddhism, a sage is the one who is wise and good, and is correct in all his characters. According to Prof. Jinjiro Takakusu in The Essentials of Buddhist Philosophy, the whole collection of the sacred literature authorized by the Council was not written on paper or palm leaf during a period of about 400 years. It is well known that Brahmanism has never written down its Vedic literature even to this day especially those revealed texts called hearing, Sudhi. We may imagine that Buddhism simply followed the example of the older religion, but there were other reasons as well. First, they dare not desecrate the sweet voice and kindly words of the Blessed One by putting them down in the profane letters of a foreign origin. The Buddha had once forbidden the translation of his words into the Vedic Sanskrit. 
how much less would it please him to write his words in the foreign Akkadian alphabet, which was used only for commercial and popular purposes. Secondly, the language they adopted in the council was, in all probability, a commingled one, something like the Pali language, that is, the language of Pataliputra. It was not advisable that their sacred language and literature should be open to the public, especially when there were some dissenting elders of a free-thinking tendency. Thirdly, to put the Buddha's holy words to letters might have seemed to them a sacrilege, just as depicting his sacred image in painting or sculpture. At any rate, the whole literature was kept in memory and was not committed to writing until about four centuries later. The Buddhist community, quite different from that of the Brahmins, was an assortment of all four castes coming from all quarters and was not suitable for a serious recital of the holy words. The result was an imperfect transmission. Fearing the loss and distortion of the original teachings, King Vitagamani of Ceylon gave orders to commit the whole literature to writing in Sinhalese characters, about the year 80 BC. 545. Saint Wisdom Without Words. Supreme Wisdom, or the Wisdom of a Saint, whereby one is enabled to look into the deepest recesses of consciousness in order to grasp the inmost truth hidden away from the sight of ordinary, understanding. The saint wisdom is the ultimate truth, points to the realization of supreme wisdom in the inmost consciousness, and does not belong to the realm of words and discriminative intellect. Thus discrimination fails to reveal the ultimate truth. However, the lamp of words is useful to illuminate the passage to final enlightenment. The saint wisdom is also the wisdom of the Buddha, or the saints or the sages, the wisdom which is above all particularization, i.e. the wisdom of transcendental truth, sage-like or saint-like knowledge. 546. The Statue of the Buddha. According to Prof. Jinjiro Takakusu in The Essentials of Buddhist Philosophy, none of the earlier sculptures of Sanchi and Barhat represent the Buddha in human figure. It is remarkable to us that the principal events of the Buddha's life have been fully given in sculpture without a figure of the hero. How was that possible? The Buddha at birth is represented by a full-blooming lotus, the Buddha in enlightenment by the Bodhi tree with a rail around it, the Buddha in his first preaching by a wheel, above which a triratna mark is sometimes added, the Buddha in his begging round, or mendicancy, by a bowl, and the like. If suggestion be a means of true art, the early Buddhist artists understood it perfectly and utilized the idea skillfully for practical purposes. However, all this does not necessarily mean that the elders did not represent the Buddha at all during his lifetime, for there is a legend which tells of their making an image for the purpose of offering veneration during the Buddha's absence. They were formalistic and realistic, and so if the Buddha was actually before them, they had a right to depict him in painting or sculpture. Now that he had passed into nirvana, however, it was improper to represent the one who no longer really lived. It was after a considerable development of the Gandhara art that the southern school of Buddhism began to have images of Buddha. This was believed at about the same time when the Buddha's teachings were committed to writing, i.e., 80 BC. The elders of idealistic and free-thinking tendencies, whom we might regard as the forerunners of the Mahayana, would not hold any meetings for the rehearsal of the Buddha's sermons, nor would they enlarge upon their Vinaya rules beyond what was laid down by the Buddha himself. They would commit those sacred words to memory or to writing as they pleased. They did not hesitate in using their talents in painting or sculpture to depict the Buddha's image according to their own ideal of beauty and perfection as they did in the Gandhara art. The trend of the free-thinking mind can also be seen in the metaphysical treatises of the optionalists, Vibhasikas, in which several opinions about dharmas or higher dharmas, abhidharmas, are gathered together, and some optional ones have been selected and recommended for study. Though the Vishasika school belonged to the Hinayana, it already betrayed a tendency toward the free-thinking school. Such free-thinking people would be bold in exegesis, erudition, annotation, or informing and expressing opinion. This, however, does not mean that they departed from the original teachings of the Buddha. 547. Four Courses of Attainment of Buddhahood. According to the Mahavastu, there are four courses of attainment of Buddhahood. 
The first stage is the prakritikarya. In this karya, an individual is expected to be obedient to his parents, to the sramanas and brahmins, and to the elders, to perform good deeds, to instruct others to offer gifts, and to worship the Buddhas. While a being is in this karya, he is just a common being and not a bodhisattva. Sakyamuni Buddha practiced this karya from the time of a Parajitid Bhaja Buddha. The second stage is the Praniti. This consists in a being's resolving to attain bodhi in due course. Sakyamuni took this resolution five times in the course of his many existences as the ancient Sakyamuni Buddha, whose life extended over eons. The third stage is the Anuloma. It is a continuation of the previous karya and consists in acquiring the virtues necessary to become a Buddha. Sakyamuni began this karya at the time of Samatavi Buddha. During the second and third karyas, a bodhisattva acquires the virtues mentioned in the Jatakas and advances from the first to the eighth bhumi. Sakyamuni reached the seventh bhumi when he was born as Prince Kusa. The fourth stage is the Abhavarda or Anivartana. This is called a non-returning karya. It commences with the bodhisattva reaching the eighth bhumi when retrogression becomes impossible for him. When Sakyamuni was reborn as Megamanava, he reached this karya the time of Dipankara Buddha, who confirmed his ultimate success in attaining bodhi. It was reconfirmed by Sarvabhidhu Buddha when Sakyamuni was born as Abhi or Abhiji Bhikshu. Subsequently, the bodhisattva was born innumerable times in order to cross the eighth and ninth bhumis. He ultimately reached the tenth bhumi to be born as Jayatipalamanava and given Uvarajyabhasika by Kasyapa Buddha, at last becoming the god of gods in the two-seated heaven. He was to complete the tenth bhumi as Gautama Buddha under the Bodhi tree at Gaya. 548. Five Kinds of Anagamins. According to the Sanjiti Sutta in the Long Discourses of the Buddha, there are five kinds of anagamins, Naham, who never return to the desire real. First, the less than half timer. The anagaman who enters on the intermediate stage between the realm of desire and the higher realm of form. Second, the more than half timer. The anagaman who is born into the form world and soon overcome the remains of illusions. Third, the gainer with exertion. The anagaman who diligently works his way through the final stage. Fourth, the gainer without exertion. The anagaman whose final departure is delayed through lack of aid and slackness. Fifth, he who goes upstream to the highest. The anagaman who proceeds from lower to higher heavens into nirvana. 549. Six Stages of Bodhisattva Developments. The six stages of Bodhisattva Developments as defined in the Tiantai Perfect or Final Teaching, in contrast with the ordinary six developments as found in the differentiated or separated school. As for the external or common to all, there are two stages. The theoretical realization and the apprehension of terms. The first stage is the theoretical realization that all beings are a Buddha nature. The second stage is the apprehension of terms. First step in practical advance that those who only hear and believe are in the Buddha law and potentially Buddha. As for the internal for all, there are four stages. Advance beyond terminology to meditation, semblance stage, real wisdom, and fruition of holiness. The third stage is the advance beyond terminology to meditation, or study and accordant action. The fourth stage is the semblance stage, or approximation of truth and its progressive experiential proof. The fifth stage during which the real wisdom is gradually opened, the screen of ignorance is gradually rolled up, the mind is clearer and clearer to totally clear. The sixth stage is the fruition of holiness, during which all ignorance and delusions will be destroyed to attain perfect enlightenment. 550. The Challenges in the Path of Cultivation. In the path of cultivation, we will surely encounter a lot of challenges. Devout Buddhists should always try to overcome these challenges so that we can have peace in our body and mind. First of all, there are ten disturbers of the religious life. They are domineering spirit, heretical ways, dangerous amusements, a butcher's or other low occupations, asceticism or selfish Hinayana salvation, the condition of an eunuch, thoughts of lust, endangering the character by improper intimacy, contempt, and breeding animals for slaughter. Next, 
we must talk about the challenges of pride and envy. Devout Buddhists should always remember that envy is generated by one's feeling of inferiority, while pride, haughtiness, and arrogance are born from a false sense of superiority. These kinds of pride and arrogance are caused by looking at things from a distorted, self-centered point of view. Those who have truly understood the Buddha's teachings and been able to obtain a right view of things will never succumb to such warped thinking. Jealousy means to be jealous of another person thinking he or she has more talent than we do, to become envious of the who surpass us in one way or other. Jealousy can be a consuming fire in our mind, a state of suffering. In meditation, if we want to eliminate jealousy, we should see and feel it without judgment or condemnation for judgment and condemnation only nourish jealousy in our mind. The next challenges are the challenges of doubt. Doubt signifies spiritual doubt, from a Buddhist perspective, the inability to place confidence in the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, and the training. Doubt, as wavering uncertainty, a hindrance and fetter to be removed. One of the mula klesa, or root causes of suffering. Skepticism, one of the five hindrances one must eliminate on entering the stream of saints. Vijikika is a Pali term, a combination of vi, means without and sakika means medicine. One who suffers from perplexity is really suffering from a dire disease, and unless he sheds his doubts, he will continue to worry over and suffer from this illness. As long as man is subject to this mental itch, this sitting on the fence, he will continue to take a skeptical view of things which is most detrimental to mental ability to decide anything definitely, it also includes doubt with regard to the possibility of attaining the jhanas, Doubt has many categories. Doubt of self, doubt of teacher, and doubt of dharma. According to Venerable Thich Hai Quang in the letters to Buddhist followers, there are four types of doubts. First, doubts of the body, doubting that whether in the past one had a body or not. Doubting that whether at the present this body really exists or not. Doubting that whether in the future one will have another body or not, one will be reincarnated or not. Doubting that in the past and in the future, whether one will have a male's or female's body. Second, doubts of life, doubting that whether there is life and body or there is body but no life. Doubting that life and body are permanent or impermanent. Doubting about who created this life and body. Doubt that the body was created by Isvaradeva, God of free will, was created through time or evolution, was naturally created, was created by the nature of life and so on. Doubt that this body was created from the soil. Doubting that if the body was not formed from the soil, then how come once it deteriorates it returns to the soil. Doubting that the body was created by dharma or not dharma. Doubting that this body was created by karma or not karma. Doubting that this body was created by afflictions. Doubting that whether this body was created by parents or not. The third doubt is the doubts of self, Doubting where does the self come from and where will it go? Doubting if there is a self, then does that self have form or doesn't have form? Doubting if there is self, then does that self have characteristics or doesn't it have characteristics? Doubting whether the self exists within the body or outside the body? Doubting whether the self exists within the mind or within the eyes? Doubting about what type of the self in the past, was it an animal, a human, and how? did it behave, etc. Doubting about what will be the type of the self in the future? The fourth doubt is the doubts about transgressions. Doubting if killing living things, animals, is considered transgressions or not. Doubting if drinking alcohol or other substances is considered a transgression or not. Doubting one's transgressions are created by the individual or created by someone else. Doubting if transgressions are created will one reap the retribution or will the self reap those retributions? Besides, there are also five kinds of doubt. These are five doubts that lurk in the shadows of the human mind and tend to discourage faith. First, doubt in the Buddha's wisdom. Second, doubt in the Buddha's teachings. Third, doubt in the person who explains the Buddha's teachings. Fourth, Doubt as to whether the ways and methods suggested for following the noble path are reliable. Fifth, doubt in the sincerity of others who understand and follow the Buddha's teachings. In addition, there are five more kinds of doubt.
these doubts that cause the practitioner to be filled with anger and resistance, but also cause his or her mind become deluded. There are five kinds of doubt that lead to a deluded mind. The first doubt is regarding the Buddha, the great master who showed the path to enlightenment. The second doubt is regarding the Dharma, the path that leads to liberation. The third doubt is regarding the Sangha, the noble ones who have uprooted some or all of the afflictions. The fourth is the doubt of oneself, of one's own morality and method of practice. The last is the doubt of other people, including one's master and other fellow practitioners. Doubting is natural. Everyone starts with doubts. We can learn a great deal from them. What is important is that we do not identify with our doubts. That is, do not get caught up in them, letting our mind spin in endless circles. Instead, watch the whole process of doubting, of wondering. See who it is that doubts. See how doubts come and go. Then we will no longer be victimized by our doubts. We will step outside of them, and our mind will be quiet. We can see how all things come and go. Let go of our doubts and simply watch. This is how to end doubting. The next challenge is stealing. Stealing means taking possession of anything that has not been given by its owner. Stealing is also wrong, even legally speaking. Stealing, one of the four grave prohibitions or sins in Buddhism. Stealing is taking what isn't given to us. It includes not paying taxes or fees that are due, borrowing things and not returning them, and taking things from our workplace for our own personal use. A bhiksu or bhiksuni who steals or violates the property of another, whether the property is privately or publicly owned, breaks the second of the four degradation offenses. He or she is no longer worthy to remain a bhiksu or bhiksuni and cannot participate in the activities of the order of bhiksus or order of bhiksunis. Devout Buddhists should not steal for any reasons. Not to steal means one should not steal anything from others. Not to steal also means that one should not rob others' rights. Not to take anything which does not belong to you or what is not given to you. Refraining from taking what is not given. Adadadana virida means not directly or indirectly taking others' belongings. On the contrary, one should give things, not only to human beings, but also to animals. The Buddha always taught in his sutras desire brings great misfortune, giving brings great fortune. 551. Eight things that led to the cutting off of affairs. According to the Padaliya Sutta in the middle length discourses of the Buddha, there are eight things in the Noble One's discipline that lead to the cutting off of affairs. First, with the support of the non killing of living beings, the killing of living beings is to be abandoned. So it was said. And with reference to what was this said? Here a noble disciple considers thus. I am practicing the way to abandoning and cutting off of those fetters, because of which I might kill living beings. If I were to kill living beings, I would blame myself for doing so, the wise, having investigated, would censure me for doing so, and on the dissolution of the body, after death, because of killing living beings an unhappy destination would be expected. But this killing of living beings is itself a fetter and a hindrance. And while taints, vexation, and fever might arise through the killing of living beings, there are no taints, vexation, and fever in one who abstains from killing living beings. So it is with reference to this that it was said. With the support of the non-killing of living beings, the killing of living beings is to be abandoned. Second, with the support of taking only what is given, the taking of what is not given is to be abandoned. The rest remains the same as in one. Third, with the support of truthful speech, false speech is to be abandoned. The rest remains the same as in one. Fourth, with the support on malicious speech, malicious speech is to be abandoned. The rest remains the same as in one. Fifth, with the support of refraining from rapacious greed, rapacious greed is to be abandoned. The rest remains the same as in one. Sixth, with the support of refraining from spiteful scolding, spiteful scolding, is to be abandoned. The rest remains the same as in one. Seventh, with the support of refraining from angry despair, angry despair is to be abandoned. The rest remains the same as in one. Eighth, with the support of non-arrogance, arrogance is to be abandoned. The rest remains the same as in one. 
552. 10 actions which produce no regrets. First, not killing. Second, not stealing. Third, not committing sexual misconduct. Fourth, not lying. Fifth, not telling a fellow Buddhist sins. Sixth, not drinking wine. Seventh, not praising oneself and discrediting others. Eighth, not being mean to other beings. Ninth, not being angry. Tenth, not defaming the Charatna. 553. Three reasons for demonic obstructions. According to most venerable Thich Thien Tom and the Thirteen Patriarchs of Pure Land Buddhism, practicing Buddha recitation also has the element of demonic obstructions for the three reasons. First, not having a firm foundation and understanding of the Buddha's teachings. Second, not encountering a good knowledgeable advisor or having virtuous friends. Third, not knowing how to practice mental reflection of oneself or lacking self-awareness. This is the most crucial point among the three. 554. Three Gradual Stages. According to the Surangama Sutra, Book 8, the Buddha reminded Ananda about the three gradual stages as follows. Ananda. As you cultivate toward certification to the Samadhi of the Buddha, you will go through three gradual stages in order to get rid of the basic cause of these random thoughts. They work in just the way that poisonous honey is removed from a pure vessel that is washed with hot water, mixed with the ashes of incense. Afterwards it can be used to store sweet dew. What are the three gradual stages? The first is to correct one's habits by getting rid of the aiding causes, the second is to truly cultivate to cut out the very essence of karmic offenses, the third is to increase one's vigor to prevent the manifestation of karma. First, what are aiding causes? Ananda. The twelve categories of living beings in this world are not complete in themselves, but depend on four kinds of eating. That is, eating by portions, eating by contact, eating by thought, and eating by consciousness. Therefore, the Buddha said that all living beings must eat to live. Ananda. All living beings can live if they eat what is sweet, and they will die if they take poison. Beings who seek samadhi should refrain from eating five pungent plants of this world. The Buddha explained. In depth the ill effects of eating pungent plants. If these five are eaten cooked, they increase one's sexual desire, if they are eaten raw, they increase one's anger. Therefore, even if people in this world who eat pungent plants can expound the twelve divisions of the Sutra Canon, the gods and immortals of the ten directions will stay far away from them because they smell so bad. However, after they eat these things, the hungry ghosts will hover around and kiss their lips. Being always in the presence of ghosts, their blessings and virtue dissolve as the day go by, and they experience no lasting benefit. People who eat pungent plants and also cultivate samadhi will not be protected by the bodhisattvas, gods, immortals, or good spirits of the ten directions, therefore, the tremendously powerful demon kings, able to do as they please, will appear in the body of a Buddha and speak dharma for them, denouncing the prohibitive precepts and praising lust, rage, and delusion. When their lives end, these people will join the retinue of demon kings, when they use up their blessings as demons, they will fall into the unintermittent hell. Ananda. Those who cultivate for bodhi should never eat the five pungent plants. This is the first of the gradual stages of cultivation. The second gradual stage is the proper nature. What is proper nature? Ananda. Beings who want to enter samadhi must first firmly uphold the pure precepts. They must sever thoughts of lust, not partake of wine or meat and eat cooked rather than raw foods. Ananda. If cultivators do not sever lust and killing, it will be impossible for them to transcend the triple realm. Ananda. You should look upon lustful desire as upon a poisonous snake or a resentful bandit. First hold to the sound hearers four or eight parajikas in order to control your physical activity, then cultivate the bodhisattva's pure regulations in order to control your mental activity. When the prohibitive precepts are successfully upheld, one will not create karma that leads to trading places in rebirth and to killing one another in this world. If one does not steal, one will not be indebted, and one will not have to pay back past debts in this world.
if people who are pure in this way cultivate samadhi, they will naturally be able to contemplate the extent of the worlds of the ten directions with the physical body given them by their parents, without need of the heavenly eye. They will see the Buddha speaking Dharma and receive in person the sagely instruction. Obtaining spiritual penetrations, they will roam through the ten directions, gain clarity regarding past lives, and will not encounter difficulties and dangers. This is the second of the gradual stages of cultivation. Third, the countering of the manifestations of their karma. What is the manifestation of karma? They should counter the manifestations of their karma. Ananda. Such people as these, who are pure and who uphold the prohibitive precepts, do not have thoughts of greed and lust, and so they do not become dissipated in the pursuit of the six external defiling sense objects. Because they do not pursue them, they turn around to their own source. Without the conditions of the defiling objects, there is nothing for the sense organs to match themselves with, and so they reverse their flow, become one unit, and no longer function in six ways. All the lands of the ten directions are as brilliantly clear and pure as moonlight reflected in crystal. Their bodies and minds are blissful as they experience the equality of wonderful perfection, and they attain great peace. The secret perfection and pure wonder of all the thus come ones appear before them. These people then attain patience with the non-production of dharmas. They thereupon gradually cultivate according to their practices, until they reside securely in the sagely positions. This is the third of the gradual stages of cultivation. 555. Abode. A country, native land or abode of a race, or races. According to the Flower Adornment Sutra, one of the three worlds, the world of countries on which people depend on for existence, the land of reward or the pure land, inhabited by the highest bodhisattvas. The land in which a Buddha himself dwells. The pure land. Also called the pure land of all Buddhas in their Sambhagakaya. There are two kinds. First, the reward land of a Buddha in which all beings are able to seek salvation on their own, the third of the four Buddhaksetra or Buddha domains, that in which there is complete response to his teaching and powers. Second, reward land of a Buddha in which all beings receive and obey his truth. According to the great Virakana Sutra, the Buddha is but etc., or abode of the living, the world is the body of Virakana. Land of transformation is the land where Buddhas and Bodhisattvas dwell, whether the pure land or any impure world where they live for its enlightenment. Medicine Buddha's land is the world of the Medicine Buddha. According to the Medicine Buddha Sutra, the Buddha land has always been completely pure. There are no women, no evil destinies, and no sounds of suffering. The ground is made of viduria, with golden cords lining the roads. The city walls, towers, palace pavilions, studios, windows, and latticework are all made of the seven treasures. <coughs> Merit, virtue, and adornments of this land are identical to those of the western land of ultimate bliss. In this world, there are two bodhisattvas named universally radiant sunlight and universally radiant moonlight. Fragrance Land or Xiang Kai, the Buddha of Fragrance Land, described in the Vimalakirti Sutra. The inhabitants live on the odor of incense, which surpasses that of all other lands. Four Saha continents are four great continents of a world. According to ancient Buddhist cosmology, there are four inhabited continents of every universe. They are land areas and situated in the four directions around Mount Sumeru. First, the northern continent, Itarakuru. The northern of the four continents around Meru, square in shape, inhabited by square-faced people. Northern continent where life is always pleasant. One of the nine divisions of the world in traditional Indian cosmology. This is the country of the northern continent, situated in the north of India, Jambadvipa and described as the country of eternal bodhitude. It is said to be square, measuring 20,000 yujanas per side. Beings there are described as follows. Superior to or higher than other continents and superior. Also called superior life because human life there was supposed to last a thousand years, and food was produced without human effort. This is the dwelling of gods and saints in Brahmanic cosmology. Second, the southern continent, Jambadvipa. This is the human world, the world in which we are living. 
Jambadvipa is a small part of Saha world, the realm of Sakyamuni Buddha. The southernmost of the four great land masses, Kadardvipa, of traditional Buddhist cosmology. It is said to be named after the jambu tree that grows there. It measures 2,000 yujanas on three sides, and its fourth side is only three and a half yujanas long. The southern continent, one of the four continents that's situated south of Mount Meru, comprising the world known to the early Indian. According to Idol in the Dictionary of Chinese-English Buddhist Terms, Jambadvipa includes the following countries around the Anavatapta Lake and the Himalayas. Third, the western continent, Gaudana, Aparagadana, or Avaragadanaya. West continent, where oxen are used as money, the western of the four continents of every world, circular in shape and with circular-faced people. The eastern continent, Purvavidiha. The eastern of the four great continents of a world, east of Mount Meru, semicircular in shape. The continent conquering spirits, semi-lunar in shape, its people having vases of similar shape. According to the Flower Adornment Sutra, there are three worlds. First, the world of proper enlightenment in which the Buddha is the Dharma king, who is the ruler. This also includes the realms of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and worthy sages, who have already awakened to the ultimate truth. Second, the world of utensils which is the world of things, of utensils, such as mountains, rivers, houses, etc. The gods and dragons of the Eightfold Division are the rulers of this world. The world of countries on which people depend for existence. Third, the world of living beings coincides with the world of proper retribution, that is, our body. According to the Pure Land sect, there are four Buddhaksetra, or realms. First, where common beings and saints dwell together, which includes impure land, Saha world, where all beings are subject to transmigration, and a pure land. Second, the sphere where beings are still subject to higher forms of transmigration. According to the Tian Tai sect, this is the realm which is temporary, where beings still subject to higher forms of transmigration, the abode of Sratapanna, Tunao Huan, Sikradagaman, Tunao Ham, Anagaman, Anaham, Anarat, Alahan. Third, the Bodhisattva realm, the final unlimited reward. Fourth, Buddha Parinirvana, where permanent tranquility and enlightenment reign. According to the Tian Tai sect, there are four Buddhaksetra, or realms. First, the land of common residence of beings and saints. The realms where all classes dwell, men, divas, buddhas, disciples, non-disciples, to ordinary beings of the six lower worlds, hells, hungry ghosts, animals, asuras, men dwell together. Lands where saints, buddhas and bodhisattvas, and ordinary people, six lower and six upper worlds, dwell together. The land of common residence of beings and saints include the common residence in pure land and the common residence pure land. Second, the land of expediency or temporary realms where the occupants have got rid of the evils of unenlightened views and thoughts but still have to be reborn. This is the land of expedient liberation inhabited by rats and lesser bodhisattvas. Third, realms of permanent reward and freedom for those who have attained bodhisattva rank. This is the land of real reward, inhabited by the highest bodhisattvas. Fourth, the land of eternally quiescent light, in which Buddhas dwell. Realm of eternal rest and light, wisdom, and of eternal spirit, Dharmakaya, the abode of Buddhas, but in reality all the others are included in this, and are only separated for convenience sake. Besides, there are five Buddhas etc. The five dependencies, the realms or conditions of a Buddha, First, the Buddha's Dharmakaya etc., or realm of his spiritual nature, depend on and yet identical with Bhutadadatta. Second, the Buddha's Zambhagakaya realm with its five immortal skandhas, i.e. his glorified body for his own enjoyment. Third, the land or condition of his self-expression as wisdom. Fourth, the Buddha's Zambhagakaya realm for the joy of others. Fifth, the realm on which the Buddha's Nirmanakaya depends, which results in his relation to every kind of condition. 556. Formless Realms. The formless realm or the realm beyond form. This is the realm of the higher deities. The formless or immaterial realm of pure spirit. There are no bodies, palaces, things. 
where the mind dwells in mystic contemplation. Its extent is indefinable in the four empty regions of spaces, Tu Kong Zhu, one of the three worlds, Triloka, of traditional Buddhist cosmology. Beings are born into this realm as a result of successful cultivation of meditative states called the four formless absorptions, Arupya Samapati, each of which corresponds to a heaven realm within the formless realm. The formless realm of pure spirit, where there are no bodies, places, things. Its extent is undefinable in the four empty regions, Tu Kong Zhu. In the formless realm there is no physicality, and the beings who reside there have lives free from pain anxiety, or afflictions, but this is seen as unsatisfactory from a Buddhist standpoint, because when their lives in the formless realm end, they are again reborn in the lower levels of cyclic existence. The heavens without form, immaterial, consisting only of mind and contemplation. According to Buddhism, formless realm meditations have the formless heaven as their objective. It is a well-known fact that in the Buddha's career, he practiced the formless dhyana with Arata Kalama, an ascetic who attained the mental state of boundless consciousness, and Adraka Ramaputra, another ascetic who reached the highest stage of being neither conscious nor unconscious. Finally, the would-be Buddha surpassed his teachers and, having found no more to learn from them, went his own way in spite of their eager requests to stay and train their respective pupils. This is the end of this video. As you already know, Buddha emphasized the importance of generosity supporting the spread of the Dharma for spiritual growth, we can cultivate this virtue in our digital age. Now I need your help spreading the Buddha teaching further by subscribing, liking, and sharing our channel, you're supporting the dissemination of valuable teachings, much like the Sangha was supported in the past. Your engagement accumulates positive karma for you and helps make the Dharma accessible to a wider audience a meritorious act indeed. Let's do this with pure intentions, free from attachment and selfishness, fostering a sense of community and supporting our own spiritual journey. These principles, rooted in Buddhist ethics, continue to guide us. You will receive great blessings for supporting the propagation of Buddha's teachings in a very simple way. By subscribing, liking, and sharing to help spreading the Buddha teaching to all human beings. Wishing you and your family always have a peaceful and happy life.